Hello and welcome back to the course on deep learning. Today we're talking about contrastive divergence. And this is the algorithm that actually allows uh, restricted Boltzmann machines to learn. So let's have a look at this. Here we've got a diagrammatic representation of our restricted Boltzmann machines. Here we've got the input nodes and we've got the hidden nodes in red. And what we're going to be covering off today is a specific part of the learning process. So we've already talked about the learning process for restricted Boltzmann machines in the previous tutorial where we discussed exactly how we feed in different uh, values, in different rows into our restricted Boltzmann machine and how it looks at them and uh, looks for features and then assigns certain nodes to those features to look uh, to further understand uh, our system and better represent our system. But the question that we still have is how does the restricted Boltzmann machine adjust its weights? Because previously in the other neural networks that we've looked at, we had the gradient descent process, which allowed us to back propagate the error through the network and therefore adjust the weights accordingly uh, to minimize that error. But in this time, we don't have a directed network. We have an undirected network. And the question is, how do the weights get adjusted here? And this is where contrastive divergence comes in. So let's have a look at this process, what's going on. We're going to look at it in two ways. We're going to look at it diagrammatically like this, and then we're going to look at it uh, through a chart, through an energy chart, which will help us understand we're going to tackle this problem from two ways. So let's go. So here we've got our input nodes, and uh, once you put them into the network, using some randomly assigned weights at the very start, uh, the system or the restricted Boltzmann machine calculates the hidden nodes. Then what's going to happen is those hidden nodes are going to use the exact same weights to calculate the input nodes or to reconstruct, the correct term is there, to reconstruct the input nodes here. And the key point here is that the weights are exactly the same, they don't change. And what is also important to understand is that the reconstructed inputs are not going to equal the original inputs, even though the weights are the same. And so let's have a look at our network our, at our restricted Boltzmann machine in a bit more depth or in a bit more detail to understand this uh, specific thing, why, why that is. So here we've got our restricted Boltzmann machine. We've got our visible nodes, our hidden nodes. And the question is, once, we have, once we've reconstructed our visible nodes, how come they're not identical to the original visible nodes, even though we're using the same weights? Well, the reason for that is because these nodes are not initially interconnected. There's no specific connection, not necessarily there's a specific connection between them, and there's no formula or equation that's connecting. Let's, let's understand this on an example. Let's look at this node, node number two over here. How does it get reconstructed? Well, it get re gets reconstructed based on the values that all of these hidden nodes, all of these five hidden nodes have in them. So once we first run this uh, RBM, these initial values will ass assign or will initiate some values in your hidden nodes. And then once we run it backwards, these hidden nodes will um, reconstruct all of these nodes, including this node. But the thing is, each one of these nodes wasn't constructed just based on this node. If that was the case, if this node was on its own and it constructed this node, it constructed this node, the value from this node was used to create the value in this node, it was then used to create this node, and then it was used to create this node, it was used to create this node, it was used to create this node, and then we ran everything backwards, then yes, this node would be identical to what it, what it, was, what it was initially. But the way the RBM works is that this node, during the fo forward pass, this node was constructed from this node, 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 from this node. Then this node was constructed from this node, 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 and from this node. So every single node here was constructed from all six of these. And so therefore, these all of these nodes have values that didn't initially come from here. They came from the other nodes. And therefore, when you reconstruct this node, even though you're using the same weights, the values in here came from other nodes as well as this node. And therefore, the value, the reconstructed value in this node is not going to be equal to what you had in here initially. And that's that's very important to understand. That's why this whole contrastive divergence uh, process exists. That's that's why from here we're going to keep going uh, and these two don't equal to each other. So there's our first pass, forward pass, backward pass. Now we're going to uh, do another one. We're going to again feed these values, the reconstructed now values of our inputs into the RBM and we're going to get some outputs or some 
hidden values. Then based on those hidden values, we're going to in, we're going to reconstruct the inputs again and again. They're not going to equal. Then we're going to reconstruct the out. Then we're going to construct the out uh, the hidden values and so on. And this whole process is called uh, Gibbs sampling. And towards the end, finally, at some point, we're going to get some in reconstructed input values, which are such that when we feed them into the RBM, the RBM, and then we uh, try to reconstruct them again, we will get those same values. So from here, we don't keep going forward. From here, this, once it goes into the RBM and then it gets reconstructed, we get exactly that. So in this final scenario, what happens is, yes, our network is modeling exactly our input. So basically, the, it, we can put in inputs in and we will always get the output. So basically our, so in essence, our network has finally, this process has finally converged and our network is finally a great model to model our inputs, to model that specific input. And in terms of the curve, what does this look like? So we've discussed this process step by step in terms of diagrammatically. Now let's have a look what this looks like in terms of curve and also what it means for us. In terms of the curve, this is what it looks like. So we've got two parts here. We start, we'll start with the formula. We've got a formula, and this is a gradient formula. So you can see the gradient on the left here. And we've got the um, gradient of the log probability of a certain state of our system uh, based on the weights in the system. And remember through this whole process, through this whole process, the weights were constant. We're not changing the weights. We're just using weights, whichever weights we have. And for now, we're also, the weights are constant. It's very important to remember. But here, what it's telling us is how the weights affect the log probability, how changing the weights will change the log probability. And the way it will change is this value minus this value. And so what are these values? Well, this is your initial state of the system, visible, uh, hidden, visible vector, hidden vector, visible layer, hidden layer visible layer, hidden layer. And so without going into too much detail on this formula, we're going to look at it on the curve because we'll supply some additional reading which you can look at in your free time. But this, let's go through the intuitive, intuitive understanding. It'll help us understand what's going on here. So we've got initial state. This is That's this one, visible hidden layer. And so that's our data space. And this is our energy. But actually, before we put these on, let's talk about the energy. Where does the energy come from? We've talked about uh, energy-based systems. And we said that in the restricted Boltzmann machine, the way we define energy is through weights. So the weights are fixed, as we saw through the whole previous process, the weights are fixed. And we're going to define this energy curve. It's defined as, as based, on the ener uh, based on the weights. So weights dictate the shape of this energy curve. And now we place our initial inputs visible and hidden layer, so our first uh, first pass through the RBM, and that's where we happen to be, just because the weights are initialized randomly. So, for example, we end up somewhere here. Then after, so that's over there, after that, that pass, now we have this pass, visible, hidden. After the second pass, what happens is we end up somewhere here. So, as we've discussed before, a system like which is governed by its energy will always try to end up in the lowest energy state possible. So as you can see, this ball is rolling towards the bottom over here. And that's exactly what's happening through that divergence process, through that process of uh, which we discussed through our diagrams as we go through, or through the contrasted divergence process, basically. What's happening is we're going closer and closer to our lowest energy state. And a good way to think about it is like if you're feeling a bit lost right now, just think of it as, remember that example of the gas. You have a room and then you let out some gas in one corner. For instance, if, if you've got a big room and then you let out some gas in the top right corner, just based on the architecture of the room, based on the conditions that the gas is being put into, hence the weights, so the, the architecture of the room or the design of the room, that is at the lowest energy state for that gas at that point in time. So the, the gas could be in a, in a much lower energy state than that. And so what the gas starts doing is it starts expanding into the whole room. This is what's happening here. Through the contrasted divergence process, we're finding what the values in our system, the inputs and the hidden layers, what they should be to, for the system to be in the lowest uh, energy state possible. So here it is. So basically, at the very end, we get certain values. Again, the weights are not changed. The weights haven't changed. But we get certain values, certain reconstructed input values, and certain hidden values 
that bring the system to the minimal energy state at the end of this contrastive divergence process. And, and in terms of the diagram, this means that this ball ends up over here. And from there, what this formula is telling us is once you have that state, once your ball is over here at the very end, if you subtract this value, and again, just check the additional reading for more information on this, but basically, if you subtract this value from this value, it will tell you how adjusting your weights will affect the log probability of this of this state, of the system being in this state. So basically, this is a recipe, this formula is a recipe for adjusting your curve, for shifting or for modifying your energy curve for uh, so that you can make sure that this state is inside an energy minimum so that you can get any desired effect. So right now it's it's converging to, or it's not converging, it's like getting towards a certain minimal energy state, but the inputs are completely different to our inputs. We want to change that. We want to use this formula to adjust our curve so this, the energy minimum, is actually next to our inputs rather than some random inputs, uh, reconstructed inputs, which are defined by the randomly initialized weights. That's the whole, that's what we're doing here. Uh, so this is a long process. As you can imagine, it takes very long. And, but in 1998, Jeffrey Hinton discovered a shortcut, which I like to call, well, I'm probably going to call in this tutorial, Hinton's shortcut. And uh, what happens is he says that even if you take just the first two passes, you don't wait to, until it converges to the very end, this is sufficient to understand how to adjust your curve as a first as initial stage. So this is a CD1, contrastive diversion one pass. You might hear that term. CD1, CD3, CD5, CD9, and so on. So we're going to do a, uh, if you do a CD1, contrastive diversion one pass, what happens is, so you know from here, you've got this, this is your green ball, this is your red ball. Your green ball is over here, your red ball is over here, and you know that, that and that's enough for you to know which way it's rolling. So like similar to what you had in gradient descent, that it, that's where it's downhill. But you now want to adjust your curve. In, in gradient descent, we just had a curve and we were like finding the minimum. Here, we have control over the curve. We are adjusting the weights uh, because it's an energy-based process. Uh, we're adjusting the weights for, so that the minimum is actually gonna be here rather than here. So let's let's look at that. So we know that the ball's doing, rolling downhill. So what we actually want is we want to, we wanna pull this curve down here and we wanna push it up over here. And that way, you'll see what happens, voila. So you can see your ball is already inside the minimum. And that way, you don't even have to go through the whole process of that, of, through the long process of um, sampling to get to that, recipe of how to adjust the curve, but you can just adjust the weights. And so basically what I'd like you to take away from here, we have an energy curve and the shape of this energy curve is governed by the weights in the system. That's just how we design it. We also know that the way we've designed the system is that the restricted Bolson machine will aim to always get to the minimal energy uh, state, the state with the minimal energy possible. And what we mean by get to that state, how, what, what's the, what's the process of getting to that state? Well, that process that we just looked at, that sampling, that Gibbs sampling process, where we input the inputs, then we uh, get the hidden values, then we reconstruct the inputs, then we get the hidden values, we reconstruct the inputs, and so on. So through that process, the system will always aim to get to values in its nodes, which represent the lowest energy state possible. Now, what we want is we want to redesign the system hence redesign the energy curve, so that the energy curve reflects, uh, so that the system is such that when we input our values, our training values, the system is already going to be in the lowest energy possible. And for that, we use this formula. So we start with some randomly initialized weights, we, we input a value, uh, what like one of our rows into the RBM, we go through this process of Gibbs sampling, we calculate this value, we find out how to adjust our curve. Plus, on top of all of that, there's a shortcut. There's a shortcut that we don't actually have to go through to the very end of the sampling process. We can just do two passes. We go first pass, second pass, and so we do a CD1, contrastive divergence one, and that will tell us how to adjust the curve. So that is in, that's the essence of it all. I understand, like, I, I can appreciate it's, 
in terms of, it's, it's a very complex process, uh, contrastive diversion, there's, there's math behind it, there's uh, steps involved and there's, there's lots of understanding, but in an intuitive way, that is what's happening. We're trying to adjust the energy curve by modifying the weights in order to facilitate a system or create a system which most, uh, which be in a, the best way possible resembles our input values, our training values. And we do that using this recipe formula over here. And if you'd like to get into more depth on this topic, on contrastive divergence, it's very interesting. Um, there's a couple of papers that you can look at. The first paper is a great paper by Jeffrey Hinton uh, and others, 2006. It's called A Fast Learning Algorithm for Deep Belief Nets. And you can see exactly that diagram here, which we discussed. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a good paper to get you started into the process. Another paper, if you'd like to get a bit more mathematical on the contrastive divergence and really understand the math behind it and uh, what's what's exactly going on with the gradients and so on, a good paper to look at is called Notes on Contrastive Divergence. It's not even it's not actually a paper; it's just just some notes. It's a three pager uh, by Oliver Woodford. I th I'm not sure. I think it's 2012, but I couldn't find out exactly the date. But it looks like it's 2012. So Notes on Contrastive Divergence by Oliver. Woodford date might be 2012 or not. And uh, of course, the link's over there and we'll include this in the additional resources. Now make sure to check out these videos on the right or the full course in the description to continue your learning. And I look forward to seeing you there.